All right, hello everybody. Welcome to the seminar about building a fictional world for narrative. My name is Brian David Judkins. I am the uh, host and DM for Encounter Party. With me this week is uh, one of the cast members from our show, Andrew Krug. Um, and uh, we, we put this talk together uh, specifically because we had been developing some, some tools over the course uh, of, of uh, an individual project. Um, so uh, when we're talking about building a world for narrative, um, we, are, we are talking about specifically inventing a fictional world that you will be using for storytelling purposes, immersion, and that sort of thing. So we've put together um, sort of a, a, a crash course on some, some hard cast rules that you guys can take home that'll give you some, some really good sort of like law-based guidelines to stick within. We're pretty confident that if you follow this general strategy that um, it's very unlikely that you're gonna sort of fall on the wayside and, and misstep in, in any sort of particular fashion. So um, one, of the, one of the benefits that we're doing, just a, just a, a quick background for a sense of context, um, Encounter Party is a, is a podcast. It's a D and D adventure podcast. It's somewhere between sort of an audio drama and and an actual play. But um, we've we've had a, a big boom in popularity in the last six or seven months. Um, we've kind of breached the international market, and as such, we have been approached by a, a studio who's like um, who's looking to convert uh, Encounter Party into more of a, a television show for for a, a streaming network. Um, so I'm just going to throw this up on the thing. This is, uh, this is an advertisement for the new show that we're working on. And this is a brand new world that Andrew and I are the lead designers on for this new, uh, this new adventure. So this is a brand new world called Isla Brea. Um, we will be referencing this over the course of our talk here to kind of give you guys a sense of, um, of comparison or some examples so that we're not just sort of talking in, in this sort of abstract theory here. Um, so just keep that in mind when we are discussing Isla Brea. This is the actual world that, that we are discussing. So let's get right to it. You guys want to build a world. You want to have your own realm of reality, your own little plaything to, to muck around with. Um, so we need, to, we need to start with the basics. <clears throat> Excuse me. Already whacking my uh, banner here. Okay, so... We're going to start, um, I'm going to read out some cards, do some introductions, and we're going to have Andrew jump in on uh, some of his particular expertise in this field. So one of the things that we, uh, we recognized when we were building the, uh, when we're talking about building a fictional world is we kind of needed to have um, a, a base set. Like, where do you start? Where do you actually even begin with the concept? Um, likely you have an idea, you have an idea for a setting, or maybe a group of people, or maybe an event. Um, and as we continue to kind of work backwards and work backwards and work backwards and start with something that we felt was just like a solid base point, we, we came up with these three pillars. And no matter what world you're building, no matter what world you're talking about, these are the three things that you need to kind of lock down early. And everything is going to be built off of these three things of the foundation. So the first one is going to be um, what is the actual physical makeup of your world. What does it physically look like? What sort of um, interesting geometric features are there? Weather phenomenons? Um, these features might be positive for the world. They might be negative for the world. Um, these are all things that are going to have factors later. Um, the next thing is uh, if you're going to be telling a story, there's going to be people or, or some sort of congregation of, of conscious living beings that are there. So what, uh, what is the rule of law? How do they govern themselves? It doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be a government. It could literally just be survival of the fittest. Um, but, but basically, what does survivability look like? Um, and then the last one is, is going to be the metaphysical, which is what sort, of belief is, uh, what sort of belief system do they have? We found as we were developing that uh, communal beings who interact with each other who are aware of their own existence um, are eventually going to come up with some sort of theory as to why they exist in the first place. And they will have some sort of uh, developed understanding of, of an idea of something greater than themselves, even if it just means another being. Um, and so you have to have 
you have to have an idea of, of what sort of uh, uh, you know um, metaphysical you know concept or belief system that is outside of a governing law that might shape these people. I'm going to pass these cards off to you every time, so jump in with uh, whatever you. Cool. Want. Um, yeah, the physical reality uh, underpins the very most basic uh, elemental properties of this world. Um, in our case, Bilebrea is a world that has undergone a geological calamity, um, and that's one of the uh, major circumstances that sort of underpins the life and um, activity of every living thing in this world. Um, how do you survive? How do you thrive and adapt to an environment that is, I mean, it's chunks of land that have been sundered from each other slowly drifting apart so travel could be i mean impossible there could be um, natural phenomena that actually um, endanger people's lives on a regular basis and how your material reality and your metaphysical reality react to those circumstances um, is going to drastically inform how this world takes shape so um, when when we when we kind of got the deal that we were going to be making the show and and we had sort of proposed the understanding that we needed to create something whole and original um, for the sake of a, of a new product. Our current uh, show takes place in the world of Ravnica, which is not our original creation. It's a compendium that was released by Wizards of the Coast that revolves around uh, a period of time within magic the gathering so as we sat down to build this new world you know one of the one of the key factors is you're kind of always hunting for originality i was looking at some of the settings that happen and i had i think i was inspired by airships i think i was inspired by this idea of the sky and then i had this idea of sort of floating islands and airships and the next immediate question is all of these things have to intertwine in a web so the next thought process becomes okay this world broke apart how did it break apart and then the idea came that well maybe there was something inside of it that broke it apart as opposed to an outside thing because we were trying to keep out sort of like space exploration so we didn't want the world to really have kind of an understanding of something outside of its of its cosmic center um so so we had the idea of of maybe something was inside of it and it broke out and then that eventually led to the idea of, of uh, in Isla Brea what we call the absent God so we ended up sort of we ended up sort of settling on this really really wholly unique concept where you have at the core of this planet was a living being uh, a deity a god some sort of, of you know grand concept of a being um, that at some point awoke and left and and exited the world and created such a cataclysmic exit wound that the entire world fractured apart but isla brea is still semi-functionally whole because it's still sort of um tethered by you know this sort of wake of energy that's been left inside so it didn't all just go complete um alderaan everywhere like it did it, it is sort of a a whole loose sort of broken shell um and one of the reasons that we kind of settled on that on that god thing is because we had we'd been discussing you know ideas of of um we wanted to we wanted to play with the idea of of a monotheistic fantasy setting um and and see if we could do it without sort of borrowing christian elements or or you know um you know some of the old some of the current monotheistic religions that exist in the world so we we started there and now you can sort of see that these things start to weave into each other. Maybe one idea drives the others or then you kind of recheck, but, but you can really start building these really, really creative original scenarios. The minute that you start allowing these things excuse the existence for other things. And that's really the concept that we're going to talk. And then the greatest challenge became obviously, well, who's going to live here? How could they possibly survive in this world? And how the heck do they have any sense of government, which is going to lead kind of into the next concept. So build a functional world. Seems like kind of a no-brainer, but it's quite easy when you actually sit down and think about causality. Who or what populates the world or polates the world? There's my first, there's my first spell. <laughs> first spelling error. 
who or what populates the world. Um, they, a Andrew, can you talk about, this is a concept that you brought up when we were writing this about the idea of successful navigation. Like they can't just live oh, in the yeah. world. They must have, they must have successfully planted themselves on this world. Yeah. Assuming that your world didn't just hatch fully formed somehow, the living beings that populate it have to have adapted to the environment that they're in. And not just the physical environment, but also the, uh, the material circumstances that underpin that environment. So uh, for us, I don't know how deep you want to dive into this. Um, one of the major powers at play in the world of Isla Brea are uh, the Aarakocra, who are naturally adapted to a world without solid ground to walk on. Uh, and that has informed this material reality where Aarakocra are very much large and in charge on Isla Brea. Um, they are effortlessly, you know, by comparison, able to traverse great distances with no uh, ground support of any kind, no need for bridges or airships or anything like that. So they are extremely successful at navigating this world as it exists at its, you know, in its uh, present state at the opening of the show as it's going to exist. Um, and similarly, everything else that populates this world has to be successful in some regard. These people exist because they've managed to survive. And that's the base level of success that you have to have. Um, beyond that, um, it's up to you how well they do and uh, what sort of resources and um, things they exploit to get where they are. We're going to, th this is going to lead into a concept that we're going to talk about later as you quickly realize everything's interconnected here. But um, one of the concepts we're going to talk about very shortly is the idea that your world has to exist far before and far after the events of your story. So these people need to have had a reason to live and exist before we ever take the point to check in on them. Um, and, and they, you know, something that we kind of just touched on before is communities and populations will form and gather and exist around these three pillars. Either there will be um, geological factors that cause people to live together, either, um, you know, People will use water to survive, so the idea of some sort of pseudo-Mesopotamia where people are gathering is a, is a natural way for geography to, to push people together or push them apart. Major mountain, raises, uh, mountain ranges, tundra, desert, things like that that work to push people away. Your, your access to habitable land might be really, really tiny. Um, when it comes to government, that's going to be a management of, of natural resources. Um, so... Um, nations, villages, communities that can sort of function under a, a similar idea of rule of law are going to gather and also um, faith-based. People are going to have a concept of origin stories, creation stories, reasons for living. These are all the things that are going to create common factors that are going to drive people together and, uh, and function uh, uh, to survive. And also drive them apart. Also drive uh, apart, yeah as competing values and needs um, create conflict and conflict is drama and drama makes a good show. Yeah. Uh, but we will talk about, we will talk about some, some hard and fast rules about drama too. Um, so let's, let's talk about the difference between inhabited and observed, which we just talked. So the world of the play is a, um, it's an industry term for, for playwrights. Um, and what that means is that, it's basically everything except the actual story, right? What is happening before the story? What is happening after the story? Um, your world needs to be open-endedly inhabitable. Um, we happen to be we happen to be checking in at this particular story. We happen to be following these particular uh, set of events or playing out these set of events. If we're playing a game or, or watching a stream or something like that, we only get to observe the world during that brief chunk. But if you haven't set up a system so that, um, you know, I, I jokingly call it the Toy Story effect, 
when you turn the lights off and leave the room, what are your characters doing? If they don't have a sense of continuity, if they don't have a sense of, of life independent of you looking at them, it'll just be empty. It won't feel like a world. It'll just feel like a, a you know, a flash card presentation of, of what you're actually trying to tell. Um, do you want to, do you want to hit on that idea about what, you know, do you, do you understand what I'm talking about, about like the, the first, like the concept of the play? It's like, why is today different from any other day? Yeah. 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 Um, your story exists because something has broken the status quo of the world. Um, whatever, uh, sort of equilibrium has been found with people, factions, environmental factors, whatever it is that your conflict and drama stems from, that equilibrium has been broken by some sort of event, person, something that incites the action of the story. Great. I'm in the right ballpark? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I got, I got distracted by one thing. I'm here. We're good. Cool. Um, okay. This is really sort of one of the um, this is sort of one of the the major cruxes that we're going to talk about here for a little while, and um, these are Andrew and I both have a, a background in in live stage, so we we pull a lot of these writing terms from there because this is kind of how we got talked in. But this is actually a, a really really important distinction that you guys need to make as you go out and you start building, okay. The difference between reality one and reality two. And when we assign those, reality one refers to our reality, our existence. Reality two um, involves whatever you're talking about, whatever you're making, whatever your fictional setting is. So for the obvious example, Earth, our world, Gen Con, this is reality one. Everything that's taking place in Isla Brea at this moment is reality two. Those relationships are going to um, those relationships are going to have sort of some different um, plays on, on on how that stuff works. So, for example, <clears throat> one of the things that you have to lock down, okay, that that has to be decided above anything, no matter how creative you are no matter how much you are trying to really reinvent the wheel or create a new character, this is a world you're building for narrative. You have to tell a story. You are telling a story to humans. It must be interpretable by humans. Like, that's just the fact is. There's no other way to get around that because otherwise it just has no value. Um, I, I can't understand... Uh, alien that uses methane to float throughout its life. I just don't understand the factors or things or drives or whatever that is. It's one of the major arguments for things like Star Trek battery acid aliens, right? It's like the, the, the argument is that, well, these aren't really aliens. They're just humans with different colored faces. Yes. Sit down and try and create a couple of alien races and you'll be surprised how quickly it just doesn't matter. Like there's just there's just nothing in there that matters to humans. They must have qualities that are human because ultimately the stories are for humans. Do you have? Do you want to expand on that at all? Yeah, I got, I got a I got a really solid example of that yeah. in my head. It's a um, a sci-fi novel that I read and, and absolutely loved. And there's a chapter in it that describes. Um, this, uh, this planet that has this sort of amorphous sea of weird amoebic life that is able to, like, separate and congeal and stuff, and it just sort of floats on the current. And when uh, the characters that are in this uh, novel examine it uh, under a very fine microscope, what they find is that these things are laid out in a molecular... Penrose tile configuration and are flipping back and forth between binary values. So it's it's a computer. The entire planet is one giant interconnected computer system that is in a like a biological substrate, and this whole species is existing in a simulated afterlife, basically, which is super cool. But they can't interact with it in any way. 
and it doesn't inform the greater story in any uh, meaningful way. It's extremely cool to me because I'm a nerd for that stuff, but it's never going to affect the larger story. I think set dressing is great. And I think if you've got something that breaks the mold and is like extremely fresh and imaginative, hold on to that because there's probably some value. in it. But also understand that for readers or audiences, it's going to be hard to engage with that in a way that makes it central to the story that you're trying to tell. Um, I know we have a couple of complaints about audio. If anybody in chat can okay. just uh, give me, it's not you, it's on my end, you're controllable, but I have some some slight muffling on my end on purpose. So I just want to see if anybody can, uh, um, if anybody can give me some quick feedback as to whether or not this audio is better for you, if you can hear me a little bit louder. I will, I will continue to ramble for people to, uh, <laughs> I can, uh, I can attempt to, mm, um, testing this super quick. Well, this is about as loud as I got. I have some dampeners on there because otherwise they're going to hear the loud piece machine. Hey, there we go. Put the mic up. There we go. There's that. There's that. That voice acting mic. Andrew, it's static. I'm static. No, it's not static. It's uh, I. I have. I mean, you've recorded in this house before. We have that air unit right there. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Say much, um, better, much better. There cool. we go. Thank you. Um, cool modern technology, everyone. So, um, yeah. So, so that's that's the thing, and that's why you know when 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 we were working, when you're talking about a world that like you know the 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 impulse was we had this new world, we had this new thing. The impulse is to like ah, we could build all these new races, we could build all these cool things. But the more we got into it, the more that we recognized that. None of that stuff is going to make any sense to people and you're going to spend all of your storytelling trying to trying to show off all this stuff instead of actually telling a relatable story. And uh, action is going to is going to just tell a story way better than description. It's just the nature of how that sort of stuff is communicated to you. So once you come to the truth that you are telling a story to humans, um, you know, there you go. Uh, that's just something you got to get over. Okay. Um, yeah, sorry. I got, I got thrown off a little bit by the audio thing, but here we yeah, go. Okay. Next point. <laughs> yeah. Next point. <laughs> Move on. Okay. So stories are the mirrors, which with, we reflect our lives. Um, this is going to, this is going to talk very closely about the ratio and the relationship between reality one and reality two. And this is, this is the, this is really kind of the key thing that is one of the most important things I can get you to kind of recognize. Um, stories and fiction give us an opportunity to experience other realities and lessons that we either can't physically or don't have the time to experience ourselves. I am never going to know what your life is like unless you tell me a story about it. You're never going to know what my life is like unless I tell you an anecdote. It's one of the wonders of existence. This idea that, that communally sharing experiences can give people advanced knowledge outside of their own physical perspective. Inventing fiction allowed us to multiply that idea indefinitely. So... When you understand that relationship, it's important to recognize that that's a one-way street, okay? Reality 2 has no idea reality 1 exists, okay? Isla Brea or Midgard or Harry Potterverse has no idea that reality 1 exists. So it's not relying on stories from us to shape worlds about itself, even though we're doing on the opposite. Why does that matter? Well, it is likely, almost assuredly, that your stories, if written well, are going to affect people in particular ways. 
They're going to absorb lessons and relatable concepts, or they might absorb things that upset them or trigger things in a particular way. Everyone's individual experience is going to be different, and so what that reflection on your fictional world looks like will be different to the individual. However, Reality 2 does not need to reflect Reality 1. You do not need to learn from things in this world in order to justify the existence of your world. It should exist independently for all its positives, for all of its faults. It exists in a vacuum. Now, we, we will talk a little bit when we get to some of the pitfall things about how that can be a good thing, how that can be a bad thing, and that can be kind of a, a, a dangerous power that you may need to wield. But that relationship is really, really important to understand um, because we don't, we don't want to stick what I'm going to call the hand of God in and start shuffling it around because everything that happens in your fictional world must be driven by those three pillars. It can't be driven by anything from this world or your immersion is just going to fall apart. Okay, so let's, uh, let's move forward to some pitfalls. Andrew, talk to us about, you know, that sort of interweb that we were talking about, how justification and causality and, and all of that stuff. Um, if, uh, if it sounds like all the three pillars are really the same pillar, uh, it's because they all interact a lot. Um, each one is going to inform the other. And what will happen, what can happen, is that you have a very strong idea or image, something that is uh, very firmly attached to the story and is not informing and is not informed by any of the other pillars in this universe that you've created. So uh, you have this extravagant uh, artifice, this, um, this environment that is populated by these wondrous creatures, whatever they happen to be, but it runs counter to the metaphysical reality you've created and has to be justified with a separate layer of reality or some other such pitfall, which will tell the audience, your reader, whatever it happens to be, that this just isn't it's not done. It needs a little more time in the oven. It's not completely finished, um, which is itself a pitfall because it's never going to be completely finished. One of the things that's, I think, um, it's a joy and it's also like a, a maddening pitfall that you yourself will run headlong into is that your development never truly finishes. The further and further you go down the rabbit hole for any given thing that it is that you want to explore, um, the deeper and more granular you go, the harder it is to find a finish line. Because unless you have the heat death of the universe written into your story, it just keeps expanding. Yeah. It provides a lot of opportunity for people who are who are willing to go the long run. The immediate thing I think about is uh, the Dune book series about just how much. How, I, okay, for better or for worse, you're gonna get people mad. It's like, <laughs> but for better, for, I, I'm I'm just talking as an example about the fact that that you know a, a rather concise story just sort of like kept going and going and going, and new things were found, and the world continued to change, and it just it it just really morphed into something completely different. Which is like Who's a super long version. Huh? No, nothing. Who's to say if that was the original intent or if you know it had value past a certain? Um, I think they were very they were they were very profitable books. But I I look at I look at sort of the reverse, which is um, um, like the Harry Potter verse, which is it all everything revolves around Harry Potter. So the minute that his storyline is kind of done, um. You know, there, there's there's so much to the world. There's so much going on, but all of the events, the whole the whole current state of the of the world, kind of revolves around Harry Potter. So you have to really start. You really have to start plumbing the other depths of the Harry Potter verse to find new narratives. 
because the world itself is just sort of running on on I, I, I feel like the Harry Potter verse is so much um, window dressing sometimes because it's it's cool places to visit. It's cool places to describe. You meet these individual characters, but narrative revolves so much around around Harry's adventures that um, it's difficult to kind of think of of, you know, what what did Victorian era look like? What did, you know, the 700s look like for this world? What is you know, 2525 going to look like for this world. Um, and, and that, that in the back of your brain, that sort of long winded, um, concept of time can be daunting sometimes to think of, and you don't have to plan out every microsecond of every year, but by the very nature of causality, things lead into something or other. There's reasons why your world is in the current shape that it's in. Right. Uh, and it behooves you as a creator to understand what those circumstances are, what it is that, you know, set the world down the various paths that it's taken to end up where it is. And a lot of that is, again, just fall back on those three pillars will really kind of set the uh, set a a base point starting point. Obviously, some of those might shift at, at given times, but every every just keep looking back to those three pillars to kind of reset and confirm and 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 check that your web is as as tight as as you want it to be um, and our process with isla brea i'm pointing this way and that probably doesn't read on too much um <laughs> i'm i'm uh, below you on the stream so, <laughs> uh, so anyway, um we've had to jump back and forth in time to justify uh stuff that takes yeah. place in world with you know you you have this kernel of an idea and then it becomes very clear that in order to justify it you got to go back yeah uh and that's what we've we've done a number of times and had to completely throw some stuff out uh that just you yeah, know we'll what get to that <laughs> we'll get to the junk part we'll get to the junking yeah. part yeah just i mean the pillars don't always exist the way they are we made the decision that the world erupted at some point so we had to have this sort of like pseudo concept of what the world looked like before that we cheated with a couple of things but um don't don't feel like your pillars once they're in the ground need to stay there certain cataclysms rises and falls of nations changes in government structure those things might shift those things around but again those shifts don't just come out of anywhere there is sort of a, a line of things that you need to establish and if that line isn't clear to you then it will not be clear to your audience and they're they won't make the connections things will feel out of place to them and and it's it's about getting as solid a foundation as you can outside of their observations so they just peek in when they want basically everything is built off of what came before unless it's a time travel yep. story. <laughs> the first thing you wrote is an original everything is built off of what came before the, you did not get you did not appear after the day this is not you did not think of the concept of storytelling you have heard stories um this is sort of a this is sort of an old writing adage and and it can be sour to swallow sometimes because you come up with a really good idea and you're like oh yeah this is so great nobody's thought of this before possibly but in its root the first thing you write is not original You've just you're you're pulling from existing knowledge to shape things, even if what you're pulling from is to do the opposite, which no one has ever done before. You got to work with this stuff, right? It is it is something that is greater than the sum of its parts. I implore you to have the creative maturity to continue working on an idea and to keep developing it. Because usually what we find during the process is you start with a really, really good idea and you start building, 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 and then you find out a better justification comes and then you start working your way backward. And it's usually on that back pass around that things start to make better sense and that's when you come up with that really, really, really original idea that's different. I La Brea did not start in the way that it did. It didn't start with the idea of a god leaving and that all sort of thing. It just started as a god. Originally, it just started as like a a, a, a military intrigue war of a couple nations. I had an idea for some cool nate. Like we were going to be in the middle of a we were going to be like in the middle of a war or something like that or this in, in you know 
some people trapped in the middle of political intrigue, but it's Game of Thrones. It's Lord of the Rings. It's all that stuff. It's all been there before. Um, you know, you are not going to invent the concept of food. That's not your job. Your job is not to introduce some new element. That is that is trying to that is trying to build something that is a concept nobody can identify with that's trying to write a story for non-humans. We don't know what that is. We don't know how to consume anything other than edible stuff. However, you can create some really, really unique recipes or you can come up with some really, really unique ways of serving some of that stuff. If you think of like, um, you know, gastronomy and some of these cool people who like build food out of architecture and stuff like that, you could serve me a story scrawled on a stone slab instead of handing it to me in a book and that would be sort of a creative thing if it adds to the process but a couple of hard pills to swallow and one of those is have the belief that the first thing that you create is not original if you're really looking for an original world you got to play with it a while but it will present itself it will i promise you will get there um give us give us some feedback on uh, on tropes because this was your concept about yay or nay how do you feel about him Tro tropes can um the one they're super hard to avoid just like like we've said with the first thing you write not being original everyone is prone to remixing their favorite influences and that's going to express itself in a number of ways, including going back to like some really strong archetypes that underpin those things, like tropes. Um, they're not necessarily bad. I'm gonna stop using the word tropes. Archetypes exist for a reason. Um, we very strongly engage with those things and there isn't anything inherently wrong with using them. Um, I think the biggest danger is that audiences and readers will very quickly identify what is derivative in the use of tropes and archetypes like that. Um, and you'll lose engagement in one way or the other. But what's cool about having archetypes to play with is that it gives you a nice little anchor point for the reader, the audience, whoever it is in the story is being told to, that they can latch onto. You have this guiding light for them to help navigate this world. I think on the flashcard we have, put your story on rails. So you have an understanding as to where this exists, the context that you want to give people by employing these specific archetypes. Peppering your world with them uh, is kind of a, a slippery slope to disaster and losing audience and reader engagement because they're just going to identify what's derivative about your story rather than what's original. So use sparingly, but there isn't a damn thing wrong with using a good archetype to underpin the action of your story. The, the people who consume your narrative or consume your world, especially if it's built well, one of the risks is that a trope just sort of sticks out. Um, but when we talk about the idea of a story being on rails, um, you don't, whoever's sitting in the cart doesn't get to decide where the rail is going. They have to be shown. So they only get a limited view and the end point is already predetermined. That's one of the risks of, of, of archetypes and stuff like that is once people kind of grasp the formula, they're just going to jump right to the end before they can interact again. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing if you think about archetypes in this way. Instead of thinking about it like, you know, a, a mine cart where you just sort of run down it to the end and then, woo, that was a ride. If you think of archetypes in the way that you would think like, um, you know, mobile pedways like in an airport that are designed to speed you through the process, um, archetypes can be a way to cue in your audience or your players that this is going to be one of these things so that they can just sort of pop on and then they don't have to worry about that things can kind of autopilot themselves so you can get to something really, really valuable. 
Um, sometimes because, you know, w when we're doing encounter party, it's pretty much improv. Um, and I'm writing campaigns and I'm writing the stories. Sometimes, you know, in the world of like Dungeons and Dragons and stuff like that, sometimes people can reason themselves out of obvious answers. Um, or if you think, <laughs> if you think of, um, if you think of like, um, like mystery stories, like mystery novels and stuff like that. Like sometimes people can be so concerned about navigating and, and discovering and stuff like that, that they miss the obvious path in front of them. So if you find that you have a super complicated environment or a super complicated narrative that you're trying to be, yeah, sticking in a, a, a big stuffy military character who doesn't listen to people and is just really anxious to push the red button it is a played out trope, but it might be a very clear enough example of, you know, exactly what this guy is. You now know exactly what this element is. And then you can play around at that. You can have him learn a lesson. You can dance around him with original characters. So using them sparingly, yes, but I wouldn't be completely put off on them because sometimes they can just be shortcuts. Okay, final note. Did I miss one? No, I did. I, I missed one. Haha. -ha. Going back. Okay. Um, yes. There we go. Your world must function before the story begins. Okay? Do not wait until page one of your story for your world to start working. Okay? One of the, one of the one of the Side notes on that is is the concept of, of exceptions, but this kind of goes back to one of the original concepts, which everything must be working. Page one of your story is a day that's different than any other day. So your world needs to function like every other day. Your world can't be built to set up that day that that young kid in a small farm town finds a sword his father left him and realizes he's a destined hero. The world isn't set up for that. The world is set up for everything else. And then that's the story. That's why we cue in. That's why we pay attention to page one. That kid counts as an exception to the world. He is an extra element to the status quo of the world. You cannot define a world by its exceptions. That doesn't that doesn't make any sense because you haven't you haven't solidified anything. You haven't explained to me why this character is an exception. You got to establish anything first. Is there I feel like this is something we talked about in Isla Brea a lot and I'm yep. wondering if you have like a yep. particular example that that sort yeah. of sums this up. My my particular example is the character that I was hoping to play um, who won't see the light of day immediately uh, because the character um, immediately establishes this massive exception to a rule, a rule that you don't know yet. So it doesn't have any value. Um, to understand how impactful that is, you need to know how it breaks away from the status quo of the world, which when we're introducing an audience to an entirely new setting, um, you know, it's more useful to figure out what the rules are so you can break them later. Yeah. If, um, the idea was that there was a character who has a rare condition. These people themselves are kind of rare to encounter. Mm -hmm. So the idea that how are you going to prove how rare this condition is? How are you going to, yes. how are you going to show how terrible this is? If, if nobody even understands who these people are, if nobody's even met them, if nobody, what's going to happen is he's going to get established as the first impression and then everybody else is going to feel less than because they're not sort of like with it on, on the program. And when but, it's one of the first yeah. characters you meet, it like you start judging other similar characters by the sort of like law of mediocrity, the immediate example that you have in front of you might as well be the basis to judge and evaluate every other person of a similar quality that you need. And like, well, that doesn't, that doesn't set the right tone or, you know, we're introducing a false expectation that we want to avoid. Conan is an exception, but the beginning of, I'm thinking about the film Conan, the, the beginning does a very quick, concise example of let, you know, it was a world of 
magic, a world of sorcery or an ancient world or I well, forgive me for not knowing that quote immediately. But, you know, the world of Conan the Barbarian sets itself up before he comes in and and does something different. Um, I don't know why that was my first example, but we're going with Conan on recording. Um, give your world time to establish its normalities before you shake it up with the exception, even though the exception may very well be the inciting part of your narrative. Um, it's kind of like yeah. telling the punchline of a joke without any setup. Yeah. Like, well, there's no expectation to subvert, so from a technique standpoint the joke doesn't work right um why don't you uh why don't you hit on this point too because this is this is another yeah. one of those things that you really have strong words on yeah i'm gonna read it so that i'm giving myself a, a good starting point here be wary yeah. of creating elements whose sole purpose is to suffer or be oppressed um recreating systems of oppression in your fictional setting is an extremely sticky subject. Um, all people that exist in this world, all sapient creatures, are trying to succeed. They all have values, they all have ambitions, hopes and dreams and family, and they are all trying to fulfill the desires that they have that may compete with other people in this fictional setting. To create a conflict, to manufacture a conflict, just to have an oppressed minority at some point, uh, can get extremely distasteful very quickly, in part because there are real people in reality one who experience very real hardships because of the circumstances of their birth that uh, recreating for the sake of entertainment value can seem extremely insensitive. So being mindful of this in your reality too, and understanding that if there is a conflict, it cannot be solely because they are meant to be oppressed. Passing it back to you. Yeah, everybody Every individual is going to have its own story. Even the people you never get to. Even people in caves in your world you never even know exist. Um, we talked before about the establishment of Reality 1 and Reality 2. Reality 2 does not know Reality 1 exists. So it might have some pretty harsh environments. Some stuff that might mimic Reality 1. However, as a creator, you exist in reality one and that means that you must be aware that people within reality one are going to reflect on what you make and this is one of the reasons that tropes can be very um weak and oftentimes everybody has their own motivations and they have their own success stories so we caution you against creating anybody whether they be superhuman or subhuman Creating somebody whose sole existence is to be set dressing for somebody else's narrative. It really, uh, it will create an incredible amount of problems for your world. So that's our advice. Um, and then rounding off with this thought, conflict comes when people have opposed opinions, not when one is destroyed over the other. Um, okay, final note here as we wrap up. Final note, I can't stress this enough. Kill your babies. Kill them. Kill all of your babies. Um, parody, satire, allegedly. Parody, satire, allegedly. Don't literally kill your babies. Um, this is a, this is an industry term. Kill your darlings, throw things in the trash, that sort of thing. Um, this is honestly the biggest step in creative maturity that you could possibly learn on your path to world building, writing, making things out of clay um, as a creator this is really the, the first step you take before um, excellence kind of comes knocking at your door and that is that just because you made it doesn't mean that it's good i make garbage every day i go to work it happens um but the ability to self-edit is really really uh it's really really important now this doesn't mean you got to throw it in the trash. 
I got a folder of stuff. I've got illustrations. I've got side projects. I'm not suggesting you destroy it unless it is just absolute terrible stuff. But even if you're having a bad day and you're getting down on yourself, put it away, store it away. Nothing says you can't put it into another project. Nothing says you're not going to wake up three months from now and go, I, now, I knew that was going to work and now I know how to justify it. But the ability to self-edit is really important. Um, you know, I have, I, I am technically the lead writer on Encounter Party, but when it came to developing Isla Brea, I never built an entire world this deeply before. I built nations and narratives and stuff like that, but creating an entire world, something that's inhabitable by a great number of people that will never met, will never encounter, I definitely needed another hand, and thankfully Andrew is is a fantastic co-writer on stuff like this. And I encourage, if you have the network, to try and go into some sort of uh, build yourself some sort of critique network. Some people who you can show stuff to, um, who might say, you know what, this ain't working, with or without ego. Um, you have to learn to trim away the fat. Even if you're going to put that fat into stock on, you know, I mean, talking food stock, even if you're going to make soup out of it later, um, be willing to cut things away. It's about getting to the good stuff underneath. Um, so that is, uh, that is how to build a world for narrative. Um, this that's should it. really, that's all you need. That's all you need. Um, is it there you go. You'll have it done by by tomorrow. Um, this is uh, this should give you guys some really sort of hard baselines that anytime you start, you know, obviously we're not going to tell you some, and we don't want to we don't want to step on any toes by telling you what sort of trees and stuff that you could uh, put in, but um, by by sort of sticking to these guidelines and sort of making sure that you never at least drop below them, this will provide some really really good guardrails to make sure that you guys keep going forward and keep building something in a in a productive sense in a comprehensive sense and it should really avoid uh, some of the traps that a lot of newer um, creators tend to fall in now uh, one of the reasons we set up the discord is so that um, you guys can get your q a questions answered we will leave this up for a good 24 hours um, that way, all you guys have to do is uh, type your questions into the chat. Andrew and I will be around as we're doing other stuff this weekend. Um, and, and we'll get to them. We'll answer them. And we'll type some stuff out. And you guys can have a conversation with us. Um, and that way, you don't have to sacrifice any of your time uh, for the rest of Gen Con. You can go off and do your other uh, events and stuff like that. Just drop your questions down there, and we'll get to them later. Any final thoughts? Andrew Krug. Um. Yeah, feel free to break every mold that we just set up for you. <laughs> um, I'm interested to see if you do, seriously. There, again, um, exceptions exist. And there are worlds that are going to defy some of the sort of concrete rules that we've set out. Um, some of your worlds, in whatever kind of medium you're working with, will exist in a parallel to ours that are underpinned by very similar circumstances. Um, there are worlds that are going to make a different pillar uh, primary. You know, it might be very similar to our reality, but you have a very specific set of cultural values that start expressing themselves and inform this entirely new uh, sequence of events. Um, there, there are going to be exceptions. And if any of this feels stifling, examine that and figure out what makes your project chafe at these restrictions. Examine those, refine them, figure out what it is that makes it yours, and then just go balls to the wall with that shit. It's awesome. Yep. Surprisingly, um, the more we work, surprisingly, the more we suggest working backwards. It has been the most productive for us um is is take an idea that you have and work your way backward to try and keep well why would that work 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 because your creative ideas are probably you know inspired and correct and, and inspired by something but as long as they're justified by something in the back even if you end up creating something like harry potter but his creation story is different or the world building up to it is different, it will wholly feel like, like, a, like a different character in a different story. So we recommend come up with a cool idea and then just start working 
backward chronologically and 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 until you hit that pillar and then once you hit it you're solid and if you can read it back to front and front to back and it all kind of makes sense there's an internal logic to it you're probably on the right track then you're ready to uh start writing stories which if you guys uh check out our stream tomorrow at i believe three o'clock i will be giving a talk on um uh, I'll be giving a writing seminar about how to how to write for entertainment and how to write for world building and and Listen get into the actual point. story part of it. Listen hey, to you know, pushing the gear. Yeah, actually, we have a lot of stuff going on this weekend. So if you guys check our schedule on EncounterParty.com, you'll see a lot of threads, um, and everything kind of culminates at the end of the the day on Sunday, where you can sit with us through through a, a session and kind of get. All of the talks sort of put together in in one big uh, in one big event. But in two minutes, you guys probably have something else you're going to go do. So we'll sign off. Put your questions in the Discord, and we'll get to them shortly. Uh, we'll start typing them out as we go through. And uh, if you're looking for something to do this evening, in one hour after we will be doing an actual play. Um, well, we'll be we'll be doing sort of a fun. D&D adventure that, that we'll be playing for entertainment later this evening with some guest stars, and we hope to see you guys there.